Hello and welcome to Brain in a Vat. This week we have a friend of mine uh, who's become a friend of mine. He runs a face blindness podcast called Face Blind. His name is Jeff Waters. And um, he's a friend of mine because I'm also face blind and encountering his podcast has been fantastic. It's been running for about a year. And uh, we've brought him on the show today to talk about face, face blindness because it's a fascinating phenomenon uh, generally and has some interesting philosophical implications. So Jeff Waters, welcome to the show. Um, we thought we would start with a story. Can you tell us a story that kind of illustrates what it's like to be face blind? I can. So um, one of the biggest fails that I've had recently with recognizing someone that I should definitely recognize uh, occurred when I took the current job that I have. Uh, so I met with, uh, what is now my boss, it was my boss's boss then, at a little diner for a one-on-one -on -one interview. Now, I knew when I got to the diner who I was meeting. I knew what his name was. And on my phone, I had a picture of him that I kept referring to. So I knew I was going to be pretty safe going into the diner and picking him out. Right before I walked into the diner, I looked down at the phone again. And sure enough, I see a man that roughly matches that description sitting at one of the benches. So I went over, shook his hand. And we proceeded to have a really in-depth, probably two-hour conversation where uh, I wouldn't say he grilled me, but it was, you know, a very detailed, okay, tell me about your sales history. Tell me about the kinds of products you've sold in the past. I asked him a lot of questions about the company to see if it was a fit for me. Fantastic conversation. We really hit it off. Uh, came home, ended up getting the job, started with the company. But, you know, these are remote positions. So even pre-COVID, I have always worked from home. And about three months later, we had a kickoff uh, meeting for the whole company down in Florida. And so we all gathered at this resort. And as a face blind person, this is really not my favorite kind of environment. So I'm standing um, in a big open area, lots, lots of people walking around, and this man comes walking right up to me. And I'll reference this again as we tell a few more stories, but I am very, very good at picking out the flash of recognition in someone else's eyes when they walk towards me. And he had that flash. I had no idea who this guy was. So he walks up, and I'm also a very good private investigator. This is one of the other advantages that I've had with face blindness. So we begin the conversation. He knows exactly who I am and he hasn't quite given me enough uh, details for me to figure out who he is. And I don't know if he said, oh, when we were in the diner or something like that, but eventually there was a clue and I realized, okay, this is the guy who hired me for the job that I have. And I've sat across a table with, from him for two hours and I still don't know who he is. Um, so that's a, that's an everyday thing for me. So do you sort of feel like the lead character in Memento where, you know, you kind of have this deep level of amnesia and you have to like look down at your arms and it's like the guy with the cowboy hat is my boss, you know, and my secret mission is, uh, you know, uh, kill him. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it must be very alarming to go through life with this sense of, of constantly not knowing, you know, who you, who you're talking to. Um, and I imagine also being met with widespread disbelief from friends and family who say, but of course you must know who I am. We've spent so many significant occasions together. How can you not know who I am? I would say it was uh, more depressing than alarming, right? So when I was younger, I grew up in a very, very small town. And I don't think it was as evident back then because there were far few, fewer people to know and memorize. Um, I mean, there were 60 people in my high school class, for example. So this is a very, very tiny town. It wasn't until later when I you know, went to college and started interacting in larger cities that it became very apparent. And even then, uh, I was completely unaware that there was such a thing as face blindness, right? So if you were blind, how would you have any idea what sight is? right? So I didn't know it was missing, but I was a little depressed because I did observe that very often I'm bad at remembering people. And I took that personally, like this was a, like an ethical failing or a moral failing. 
Yeah, I think what's really interesting about that story is that it's not like you weren't paying attention to to your boss. Um, he was crucial to your well-being. He was hiring you. Um, so I think a lot of people who don't understand face blindness, which is probably a lot of people, um, they, they just assume it's a lack of attention, that you don't care. Um, and so when you don't recognize them, they think that you're snubbing them in some way by just not having enough uh, care to, to really remember who they are. Yeah. And in, in, in terms of reactions from other people, um, one common theme that I hear over and over again in the interview series that I do on my podcast is this almost word for word reaction that people have when you describe what face blindness is and that you have it. They listen and then they say something like, oh yeah, yeah. You know, I'm really bad with names and faces too. <laughs> And, and that's the thing that goes right up the butt of every person with face blindness. <laughs> and, um, and I hear that over and over again with guests. Yeah, I can understand that. I, th I think uh, what it is, is that they don't understand that it's a category difference. So, you know, so, so face blindness is on a continuum, but above a certain point, once you're really bad, like really, really bad at recognizing faces, it really, it makes you non-functional in the world in certain ways. Um, we get by, so we're able to recognize other people through, through other ways, like looking at the way they walk or their gait or listen to their voice or the clothes they generally wear. But um, absent those features, let's say someone walks towards you at a distance, uh, from a distance, and you can't really pick them out uh, by their other features, you'd have no idea who this person is. Um, and someone who's just merely bad with faces or names, they, they would still know. Um, they're, just, they're just vastly overestimating the number of situations that they can't recognize someone in, compared with face blind people who it's, it's really like all the time. Have you ever heard of uh, chicken sexing? <laughs> yes, I wrote a story about chicken sexing once. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, with chicken sexing, uh, you know, apparently with uh, baby chickens, it's impossible to tell the difference between male and female very easily. And there is a class of people who have built this skill to be able to quickly pick up a chicken, look at it, a chicklet, look at it and say, yep, that's a male. And they have an astonishing accuracy rate, right? And I think about that sometimes when I think about like normal people walking around and their ability to recognize other people just by a few minor differences in a face. That's astonishing, right? We take that for granted, but that doesn't even make sense. If you're an alien race coming to look at us, we would all look exactly the same, right? What I find kind of interesting to, to me is how, I mean, Jason, and I have been very good friends for a number of years and uh, his discovery of his own face blindness kind of came out a little bit by accident. So um, I'd sent him a video uh, about uh, deep fake technology. So the idea is that you can have uh, a video and you can go and superimpose um, other content on top. So one of the famous videos is of Barack Obama and they had an impersonator and they would digitally manipulate the lips and then the impersonator would, would produce vocals and you could create this fake video. Uh, and the tech has gotten quite impressive over the years. And I, I sent Jason a, a video, which I'm going to include in this video, um, of Bill Hader doing an impersonation of Tom Hanks, sorry, of Tom Cruise and, and of Seth Rogen. We had like, uh, you know, when you do a movie, you do table reads, you know, where like all the uh, actors get together. Well, at the and beginning of the At the production. beginning, before anything, you get together and you read through the script. And um, so it's like, you know, all these heavyweights, like, you know, you know, Ben Stiller, Jack Black, Robert Downey Jr., everybody, and at the end is like me. Like, you know, like, hey, <laughs> just happy to be here, guys. <laughs> you know, like, and uh, some other supporting guys. And then, uh, and then Tom Cruise walks oh in. And even those guys are like, whoa, and he's super stoked to be there. <laughs> you know, just like, yeah, oh, boom. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> he's like, wow. <laughs> he's just immediately excited um, <laughs> when he walks into a room. And, uh, and uh, so he comes over and he sits next to me. And I think he had been briefed on some of the mm -hmm. supporting guys, but uh, he was like trying to place me, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so he sat down next to me and he's like, I, uh, I love your work. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, oh, thanks. Uh, I love your work too, Tom Cruise. <laughs> you know, like, thanks. <laughs> 
And what's amazing about the video is that the deep fake tech then imposes um, Tom Cruise's face on Bill Hader's face when he's doing the impression and imposes Seth Rogen's face. Now, Seth Rogen has a beard. I mean, he looks pretty damn different to my mind um, from, from Hader. And uh, I sent this to Jason. I was like, don't you think this tech is amazing? And his response was, I, I think you sent me the wrong video. I, I, I can't see what you're getting at, you know? Um, and I said, no, look, his face literally changes faces. You know, go to this minute line. No matter how many times we did it, how many times I showed him, he was completely unaware of the fact that the face had shifted. And it made me think that it's, it's kind of an incredible way of checking if someone has face blindness. Um, and I think a lot of people are unaware of the fact that they have it. So um, what I've started doing is showing people some of these deep fake videos as a reference point to see, because it does some of the, the work um, quite well. So the other video is um, from uh, No Country for Old Men. And there are four different actors uh, and only their faces have been superimposed on the rest of the, the character's face. Um, and so what you have is all things remain in constant, but for the face. So the hair is of the character, the background, all of that stuff remains the same, the gait, it's just the face. And Jason again was completely and utterly unable to see that there were four different incredibly well-known actors uh, superimposed on this character. And in face blindness groups that he's part of, similar things happen. Almost no one was able to, um, to see it. And, um, you know, I was telling my father this story the other day and sort of saying how amusing it is and showed him the video. And he said, but that's the same guy. Uh, what do you mean it's four different people? <laughs> you know? and, and then my dad said to me, he's like, you know, that makes a lot of sense. I, I really do struggle to remember people's names and faces. <laughs> Well, a couple of things that we should point out here. Uh, number one, Jason may have mentioned it, but there is a spectrum, right? So there are people who are very mildly face blind. I put myself on that end of the spectrum and there are people who can't recognize their own family or even themselves in the mirror. Um, and that doesn't get any better, right? So for me, eventually I will build up a profile of a person through repeated exposures and I'll eventually get them. Um, well, there's a caveat there too. Some people I never get and some people I get instantly, right? So, and I can't quite figure out any common element that would explain that. Um, so there's a spectrum of how bad it is. And then there's also the fact that face blind people can actually see faces. I think that's a really important thing to understand. So, you know, often in, in media, if you ever see a, you know, an article that's written about face blind, they'll have a picture of a face that's fuzzed out as the image that goes along with the article. And that's not what we're experiencing, or at least not what I experience. So I can see a nose, I can see an eye. When I'm looking at your face, um, you know, you have a very, Jesus with glasses vibe. I can, I see that, right? Um, and so. Not me for the record. This is Mark. No, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Mark. Has the Jesus with glasses vibe. Okay. That's Mark. right. Yeah. <laughs> and um, actually when, when we first spoke, Jason, it was, a, it was a little strange for me because we both have facial hair. You wear glasses, <laughs> but we, all, we also both have curly hair. And so right, I was a little skeeved for out me. for a moment. Yeah. <laughs> um, so my, my point here, though, is um, when I go into private eye mode, I think I have built up a lot of skill in recognizing differences because I have to work so hard to recognize differences between faces. So, you know, that coupled with me being on the milder end, I think I have a little bit different different reaction to those um, videos you're describing. So the old country, what is it? Oh, uh, no, uh, no country for old men. No country for old men. Thank you. Um, so that video, when I watched it, Jason sent it to me. I looked at it knowing that, okay, there's a face blind trick I'm supposed to suss out here. So I was on high alert and I could tell for sure when they had, you know, different act actors faces but uh, on the same token, if I weren't on high alert, oh, and in that video, the only, the only face that I definitely recognized was Arnold Schwarzenegger. I'm pretty sure he was one of them, 
right? And, you know, that's an iconic face that I've seen in static form uh, in motion for my whole life. You know, I don't know how many thousands of times, maybe tens or hundreds of, of thousands of times I've seen that face and, I, and been associating it with Arnold Schwarzenegger. So I have him, right? But if I were watching that movie and they did the whole movie with deep fake and put his face on it and I wasn't looking for it, I'm quite positive I wouldn't have noticed it. And I wouldn't have noticed it because a face blind person would look at that character and think, wow, this is an easy one. He has such distinctive hair right? He's got a really bad male haircut. It's dark black and it's very unusual. I've never seen that haircut on any other male, right? And that's the first thing that I would notice. And then I would just stop bothering with the face as I'm watching the movie. And they probably could have slipped Arnold in for the whole movie. <laughs> yeah. So hair is crucial. Um, I think I, I have the same experience. I often recognize people by their hair, but I recently had this experience where I recognized an actor who was in a full body metal armor suit, including a helmet. So couldn't see his face at all and hadn't spoken yet. And he walked in on the set of this, of the, it's the Mandalorian season one, season two, episode one. And he walks in, he, he walks into the set and I immediately knew that this was, I think his name is Oliphant. Tim um, Oliphant, yeah. Yeah, just the way he walks because it was such a distinctive walk. Even with the full body metal suit on, I could tell that. And, and I often find that watching Star Trek as well, they have layers of makeup on mm. and I immediately know who they are just by the way their face moves. Um, even though I can't recognize their face or I recognize their voice. Um, so you mentioned this a bit earlier is that um, you, you're an excellent private detective trying to work out who people are. Um, and I think face blindness does engender us with certain superpowers because we have to overcompensate in other, other, you know, other talents for recognizing people. So we're very good at recognizing people's voices or the way they walk or the types of facial expressions on their faces, um, but, but not their actual configuration of their face. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm also, I, something that I think is interesting about these stories that you've mentioned is they're both funny and also not funny. Um, so there's a comic element to them, but there's also something incredibly um, sad about living a life where it's very hard to recognize the people around you. I think that could be the case. Um, the last gentleman I had on, uh, on my podcast, though, uh, made me think of this in a different way. Um, he is just a very, has a positive outlook on life in general, and he's not let this stop him in any way, shape or form. And he's always uh, said, all right, society expects that people ought to recognize each other after one viewing. Well, that doesn't work for me and I don't agree. And so he lives his life, not, not, it doesn't matter to him how often he has to say, oh, what was your name again? Or who are you? And um, I think that's a, a really positive way to look at it. Um, and that's kind of part of the message with the podcast is um, the natural reaction is the one you described. The natural reaction is there's something wrong with me. This is sad. I'm not, I'm different. I'm not operating like everyone else. And, um, and I don't think it has to be that way. You know, another interesting um, reaction to face blindness in my life is I think it has made me be perceived as well and maybe even in actuality be a very open and, and friendly and kind person right so that's what I project the classic story I always tell is when I go to the grocery store you know there will definitely be people in the local grocery store the mo local market for me who I should know and who will recognize me right and as I walk around the grocery store everyone who walks up to me I maintain this neutral but happy look on my face and make eye, can't, eye contact with most people who are walking towards me. And you know, there's a delicate balance that I don't consciously do anymore. I think this is just naturally developed over the years where um, you know, I'm looking at them, but I'm not staring at them like a serial killer, right? There's a, there's a certain balance you have to maintain. And you know, that just makes me seem like a, a happy, kind, friendly, open person. Because that way, if they walk by, Oh, that was a nice guy. Maybe if they even think of you at all, but if they do know you, I can go into private eye mode 
um, and I haven't broken the spell yet, right? They, they assume that, they, that I know who they are and they'll give themselves away in the first five to 15 seconds usually. And then I'll be able to place them and then we continue on with the conversation. But I find that quite often that, uh, you know, especially with males that uh, I interview, they very often have that sort of demeanor. And it's a little bit like smiling. You know, if you use the, the muscles in your face to, to smile, it can, you know, some people believe drive a chemical reaction in your brain that makes you happier. So it's the, you know, the tail wagging the dog. So I think that may be true of face blindness. Now, on the contrary, uh, I was shocked in interviewing one woman who I told that story to assuming that she also shared that same outlook on life. And uh, she said, well, you know, a woman who's much smaller than most of the men around her cannot walk into a strange place and be open and friendly like that because it could be dangerous. Yeah, I mean, you raise a couple of fascinating points. I mean, the one is the, the tactical way to be in the world. Um, and how, as you say, that sort of depends on who you are. Um, so I, I have some understanding of what this like for in a funny way, partly because I'm very recognizable having, you know, a, a Jesus-like appearance. And, and I've kind of looked this way for about 20 years. And I used to go to a lot of concerts. And so, you know, people would see me, um, and I wouldn't sort of be aware of them. So we never let's have a conversation, but you put enough drink in people and they're at a concert and they're going to come up to you and going to go like, Hey man, it's so good to see you again because they've seen me at various other shows before. And I would have this complete sense of, I don't know who this person is and I have no idea whether I've spoken to them before. Um, but they seem to know me. So I guess I should engage with them as if I know them. And, you know, I, I developed that, that demeanor and, you know, engage with people on that basis. Um, and friends sort of knew this about me and then started sending people my way saying, go tell that guy, you know him and see how long he plays along for. And I, you know, <laughs> would play along and say, Oh, it's so good to see you. And wow. How long has it been trying to do exactly the private detective work? But I, I also wonder, is there something about the kind of um, out perspective? So something that Jason did a couple of months ago was to say, you know, uh, I have to do a second coming out and I want to tell everyone um, that I'm face blind. And if I bump into you, um, I'd really appreciate it if when we do that, if you could say, hey, Jason, it's Mark, good to see you again. Um, and that'll make the conversation much easier for me. And if I don't recognize you, it's not because I dislike you or I didn't pay attention. It is this um, situation that I find myself in. And I thought there was something interesting about that out approach. So it was met with, I mean, Jason probably go into more detail than I can, but I think met with a lot of sort of what, what do you mean? You don't recognize faces. That just strikes me as bizarre. I, I, I cannot understand how you could say that. Like you, you must be on some other planet. And then I think other people sort of saying, Oh, okay, I get it now. Um, you know, all right, I'll, I'll comply and I'll do that. I mean, to give you an idea, so Jason and I've been friends for a number of years. Um, and we had set up a business meeting with, with a mutual friend. Um, and I normally arrive at business meetings kind of suited up, uh, but I happened to arrive much more like a Hawaiian shirt day that day. And our friend had just had his haircut and we were sitting down. We'd arrived early. We were chatting. Jason sat down at the table next to us, did not recognize us at all. And only once our voices got elevated, did he realize, Oh, that's Mark and Ramon. I should go and join them. Uh, so if it can happen to me, it can happen to anyone else. Yeah, so I, I actually have chosen Mark as one of my friends because he's so distinctive. <laughs> but the problem was that that day he 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 wasn't. He wasn't wearing what he normally wears. Um, yeah, I I, th I think that incredulousness that people uh, have when when I tell some people that I'm face blind and they say, "But you do recognize me. You often recognize me." Yeah. So you know, that, that private eye is working hard and often successfully, right, to work out who they are um, and, and often seamlessly. So they have no idea that I don't know who they are maybe for a minute of the conversation or 30 seconds or whatever it is. Um, and that there's, it's kind of quite an emotionally high stakes game, right? So when you encounter someone and you don't know who they are, if you say, I don't know who you are, you risk alienating them. And, and they say, well, what do you mean? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm Mark, I'm your best friend. Um, or, or on the other hand, if you try and private eye and you fake knowing who they are, 
and you don't work it out quickly, then you can really appear like a buffoon. Well, two, two comments to that. One is, um, I think I am grounded enough to really understand that most people only think about themselves for most of the time, right? So we build up in our minds as face blind people, uh, the severity of making a mistake like that. It, even if it does happen, it's quite likely that if you asked the the person that you think you offended a week later, or you said, man, I'm really sorry. I didn't recognize you. They may say to you, what, what, what are you talking about? You know, I, I, I was, I mean, I think I remember that, but I was really more worried about whether people would notice the mustard stain on my shirt. <laughs> sure. Sure. I mean, that makes sense. Uh, maybe something that is very hard for the prosopagnosic for the face blind person is a total non-issue. Uh, for other people. So I used to, I used to teach. And so I, I felt it was incumbent upon me to memorize the names of my students so that, you know, I could call upon them in a class and sort of keep everyone accountable. And so I would kind of, my little trick was um, on the first day of class, I got everyone to tell me a very embarrassing story about themselves and their name. And then I could fix that in my head. And I was pretty good at remembering names, but I'd always carried some sense of, I'd feel quite bad if I called someone by the, the wrong name. And I also, I generally, because of the way that I look and because I'm kind of an unusual person in many ways, um, people know who I am. Uh, and on the very, very rare occasion that someone gets my name wrong or introduces themselves to me if we've met on a prior occasion, I do get offended, um, um, partly because it's such a rare occurrence for me. Um, although, as you say, I think for most people, it's just one of those you know, oh yeah, of course we've met before. Sorry, I forgot about it. Not a big deal sort of situations. Yeah, that's right. By, by the way, I've been through all kinds of strategies to try to overcome this. I used a, a software tool called Anki at one point, which is like a, uh, you have a series of cards that get revealed to you depending, you know, the frequency is dependent on how often you get the card right, right? It's like flashcards for learning anything, right? And I went through and meticulously took all the images out of my uh, address book and put them into Anki. And, you know, I would categorize people by must recognize, nice to recognize, you know, that sort of categorization. And I practiced the heck out of it. Um, and then I found that that really didn't work uh, very well over time. And so another strategy that I tried is I got deeply into mnemonics, uh, can't say it, mnemonics for a while. One of the strategies that people would use like in that class situation that you described is uh, you take the person's name and you turn it into some sort of a crazy image that in some way, you know, pulls on that neural net in your mind to bring the full name out. Mark, yours is really easy. Like any mnemonist that's going to use this technique um, would have a giant green check mark on a, on a mushroom cloud, right? <laughs> Um, and so that's how you could easily remember everybody's name in, in a whole room. Um, but if you're face blind, you have to then attach that to a face and that becomes challenging. And so um, they did say, you know, pick, pick something that's the most distinctive on a person's face. And oddly enough, I can make this work sometimes because I, it forces me to look at someone's face and find the most distinctive feature and focus on that at the exclusion of everything else and then try to attach the crazy image. So my favorite story on this uh, that did actually work is I had a customer um, who I'd been visiting, I think once a week for a couple of months. And every time I would arrive at the company, I would sit in the waiting room after checking in. And as employees would come walking out from the back to greet people in the waiting room, is that him? Is that him? Is that him? His name was Peter Miller, right? And so after I learned this technique, I applied it. And so it made me for, it forced me to look at him and say, what is distinctive about his face? And it was a very tall forehead. That was the, the only thing that I could sort of point to, which is odd because that's the blankest part of his face. Right. But um, I then implanted this picture of a penis being stretched out between two giant uh, millstones and his name is Peter Miller. And it worked. About a month later, I came back and he came walking out. 
I recognized him and I was jumping for joy, which is another thing that, you know, face blind people often talk about is you have this, you know, this joy and you almost want to tell the world, oh my God, I recognized you. And it's the most mundane thing for everyone else. So you can't. <laughs> so this kind of reminds me of something that Jason alluded to earlier, which is this idea that if you've got a different way of being in the world, you wind up having to develop skills that other people wouldn't have. So I mean, I just find it delightful, the idea of Mark and, you know, the J. Robert Oppenheimer mushroom cloud from Nuclear Blast. Like, I would never have thought of that. And it's so great. Uh, you know, one of the sort of interesting cases that uh, Malcolm Gladwell writes about, he writes about dyslexics. And um, one of the examples he gives is of this very famous trial lawyer. So the guy, you know, really, really struggled to read. Um, and the way that he would process information was uh, through listening. And he just developed this incredible oral memory, um, which is the kind of thing that most people don't have to do because they're able to take notes. And what he was able to do as a trial lawyer is, you know, in like a 37 day trial, you know, you can have a witness on the stand who says something in day three and then contradicts that, you know, on day 18. And he could say, but hold on a second, like you said the following over here and he could remember it so well wow. in a way that other people couldn't uh, and because no one else needed to. And so often having this sort of different way of being in the world forces you to become really, really excellent at something that other people never had the need for. And it can give you huge strategic advantages. Um, and, and I mean, if, you know, just being able to come up with a, a penis strung between two millstones, you know, put on someone's five head. I mean, what more do you want out of life, man? <laughs> <laughs> so Jeff, something, something that's, I mean, this is a philosophy show and uh, what's very interesting is that face blindness has some intriguing philosophical uh, kind of implications or at least suggestions. Um, so one of them is that I've started to become very skeptical about the existence of faces. Um, so I can see that people have eyes. Um, I can see they have a mouth and a nose. You said earlier that, that face blind people can see faces, but I've started to doubt whether that's true and whether any of us can see faces. Um, I can definitely see individual eyes. I can see the nose. I can see the mouth. I can see each ear or if they move, then I can see the ears, but I, I don't know what it means to look at a face. Is that just the, that location where all those things are, are located, but that doesn't seem to be what people really mean when they talk about a face. When people talk about a face, they'll often talk about the same face uh, over decades. You know, I recognize your face, even though the last time I saw you was when you were 10 and now you're 50 and I can recognize your face. Um, and, and you were talking earlier about, uh, about um, a continuum. Um, so you get people who are totally face blind, people who are only slightly face blind, and then you can keep that continuum going and get to super recognizers. These are people yeah. who don't just recognize faces, but recognize them incredibly well, better than most of us. Um, and super recognizers, what they found can recognize the childhood pictures of, of famous actors or actresses. So they can pick up that this was uh, Sylvester Stallone when he was five, um, even though they haven't seen any pictures of him younger than, say, the age of 30. Um, and most people can't do that. Face blind people definitely can't, but even uh, neurotypical people can't do that. So, but what, what, those, what those face, those super recognizers would say is St Stallone has the same face as he did when he was five. And that, that's fascinating to me. It seems I, I, I've started to doubt whether faces are real at all. Well, first, uh, just before this episode started, I happened to be watching a little video about Dave Grohl, you know, the singer. He's a, a singer um, from Foo Fighters, and he was in Nirvana originally. And I just got sidetracked, you know. I noticed that it, I saw him on TV recently, and he was chewing gum while he was uh, – singing and playing the whole time. And so I just typed in, why is Dave Grohl chewing gum? And, you know, I saw a video where someone had done a deep analysis of this. Turns out he's done it for his entire career. And I saw some early uh, video of him playing with Nirvana. And I compared that to him now. I actually, I think, might recognize Dave Grohl if he passed me in Chicago, uh, which is not a city that, or a place that I go to very often. And I certainly loved Nirvana when I was that age. I don't see any resemblance whatsoever to old Dave and new Dave. They look like totally different people. 
so that was just a weird aside, but I'm intrigued by your idea that faces may not exist. This is a little something like groups don't exist. Maybe uh, that might be a Jason yeah. only thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's actually the same issue is that, um, so we're going to do an episode about this at some point, but I, I don't think groups exist, social groups. I think there's just a series of individuals, but there's no groups of individuals. Um, and I think you might see a face the same way. It has a series of individual parts, a nose, a nose, a nose an eye, an eye, a mouth, ear, ear, and a forehead. Um, but I don't know why we seem to think that makes a face. It's very strange to me. Yeah, so for those of you watching at home, uh, Jason doesn't have a tree behind him. He just has, you know, <laughs> you know individual leaves. Uh, there is no couch. There's just, a, you know, a section of material that happens to be strung together. Uh, and it's only you normies who want to call it a couch. Um, I mean, it's, it's an interesting view. I mean, on, on some hand, you know, the one is, Jason's line is, hmm, I've got this incredibly rare condition from when I gather face blindness. About 2% of people have this. It's the other 98% of you fuckers who aren't seeing reality. <laughs> That's the Jason line. And yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah. Maybe, maybe you guys are the next evolution. <laughs> and the rest of us are all misperceiving things and inventing yeah, yeah. so-called faces. So I, I think what could be happening is that uh, people have evolved the ability to recognize faces, but yeah. it's, ac it's actually not a, a, a real uh, uh, perception on the world. It's, it's, it's something that people project onto the world. And it's, a, it's kind of like an algorithm that works well most of the time, but for some people breaks down. And what we've assumed is that there are faces in the world, that faces exist on people, but they actually might not. It might just be our algorithm projecting something onto people. Um, now, now, just about the couch and the tree. So where I draw the line is that I think that a collection of individuals exists only when um, that collection isn't said to be doing something in itself. So when we talk about a group, we talk about a group having agency. So like um, America can go to war. So America does something or the chess club uh, won the competition. Um, and when we talk about a face, we also talk about it having agency. So the face smiles or the face grows over time or the face wrinkles. Or So we talk about the face having agency that's more than the sum of its parts. And, and when that happens, that's where I get skeptical. So when we talk about a couch, uh, the couch is not doing anything and the tree is not doing anything. And so I'm happy to say, well, that's, that's an aggregate, no problem. But it's as soon as we ascribe agency to something that's more than the sum of its parts, that's where I start to get a little bit uncomfortable. So according to Jason, I'm not holding this glass with my hand. You know, it's just with my fingers and my palm pressed against there and the thumb being a separate entity. That's interesting. I mean, that's interesting. That's, so you're saying your hand your hand would have agency. And so I need to be of the view that there aren't hands. Yeah. I mean, what's a hand, but in other words, the conglomeration of a palm, you know, four fingers and a thumb and the skin and the bones and all the underlying structures. And clearly we say my hand grasps things. It does stuff. It acts in a certain way. You know, it gives you certain symbols. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, look, may maybe that's the case. Maybe this uh, shorthand that we have for my hand and my face is somehow metaphysically illegitimate. Um, but uh, it seems to be incredibly oh. useful. Okay, so you just said metaphysical. And um, I, I have to say, I was telling you both before I came on that I'm a little scared of philosophers because I know you can talk me under the table with jargon. And I'm surprised you haven't used a bit of jargon until now. Um, the joke I made with Jason earlier before coming on is that epistemology to me is what happens when I drink too much beer. Um, so... <laughs> um, to dive in a little bit, though, I, you know, that's why I love your show so much, by the way, too, because it is approachable for someone that is, you know, reasonably intelligent, but has no background in the jargon of philosophy. So um, please keep up the good work. I'm, I, I listen to it every week. Um, I'll say this. Um, there may not be a face. So I could go down this path with you a little bit. If you were to say, hmm, we lack the wetware to perceive electromagnetism. But if we did, your, your interpretation of a face as a whole mixed in with the smell and the shape that you can see with sight would be totally different. And that exists. We just can't see it. 
That's my okay. attempt at being philosophical. <laughs> I see. I see. So, so, so what you're saying is that um, if my marker for whether something exists is whether I can perceive it, um, and the fact that I can't perceive faces uh, is suggesting that there aren't faces, that would be a bad marker because in other cases like electromagnetism, uh, it's not possible to perceive it, um, but we, it is still there, right? right. So perce- the lack of perception in some people shouldn't be a marker for it not existing. Um, yeah, and I, I think that's true. There are things that exist that we can't perceive, like numbers. Um, numbers exist. Um, and I mean, if, if numbers didn't exist, it would be very hard to build bridges. Um, it would be very hard to build skyscrapers or go to the moon. Um, you need to do calculations. And calculations involve these numbers. So they have real effects on the world. And yet you can't perceive a number. You can't perceive the number two. Um, so I think you are right that perception is not a necessary condition for some, that, that we can perceive something is not a necessary condition on it existing. Um, Mark, I think, um, can you define metaphysics for Jeff? Yeah, I, I really like the idea of us having like a, a layperson sort of philosopher alert, like, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I suppose what I mean by, so just to draw the distinction between epistemology and metaphysics, you know, epistemology is, you know, what we know and the metaphysics is what is actually happening in reality. Um, and so there might be certain things that in principle we don't know or can't know, um, but might very well exist. Um, and so there can be this sort of disjunct. Um, and the question is whether things like hands really do exist um, or whether it's some kind of social construction, something that we've invented because it's, it's useful and whether the invention of itself makes hands exist um you know some people take the view that you know we can use our thoughts um to frame reality and then that makes things real uh so the prevailing wisdom around um things like uh, money and um states and these things is that we kind of create them through some kind of collective agreement so we can turn a, a colored piece of paper into a medium of exchange because we have said so and proclaim it and therefore it becomes money. And if we stop believing it, then it becomes worthless. So like uh, Deutschmark from East Germany were money at one date. And once we stop believing them to be money, they cease to be money. Um, Jason wants to deny that these things ever have any metaphysical existence. And we will do an episode on this at some juncture. Is that a yeah, classification so- of philosopher? I hear you guys sometimes saying I'm a XYZ and the other person says, Oh, well, I'm a strict fundamentalist or, or something. Uh, yeah, so the, the type of category that, that would describe this view is an eliminativist. So I'm eliminating, eliminating um, social phenomena from my, what's called my ontology, my list of things that exist. Um, and Mark uh, is probably more of a social constructionist. So he thinks that uh, we can together agree that these things exist and in so doing, they do exist. Um, and there's a famous philosopher named John Searle who, who has really pushed this view and he says that uh, money is just as real as rocks and trees um, and cocktail parties and chess clubs and political parties are just as real as rocks and trees because we have collectively agreed that they exist. And he would say that faces are just as real as noses because we collectively agree that this collection of features together denotes a face. This is another weird aside, but um, I've been using Sam Harris's uh, meditation course recently. And in the beginning course, there's a section where he works very hard about halfway through to have you ask the question if your head actually exists at all. And, (laughs) uh, you know, you're doing this while in a meditative state, so it can be kind of jarring. If you were the only person on the planet and there were no reflective surfaces, your face wouldn't exist. Yeah, because there wouldn't be collective agreement that your face exists. So that would be your view, Mark, right? Interesting question. I mean, uh, it it might be the case that you cannot know that you have a face, um, but nonetheless, you have a face. You might think that you don't need actual collective agreement, but merely the possibility of it, uh, uh, or that, you know, uh, a face is more like a number. In other words, uh, it's the kind of thing that exists abstractly regardless of whether human beings exist. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, that, that um, Harris stuff is pretty interesting. I mean, there's this sense of asking you to contemplate whether you are an I, uh, whether 
you have some kind of distinct existence, you know, or whether really there's a series of um, thoughts flickering on a movie screen, you know, and that there is no you-ness. I mean, he's quite skeptical of personal identity. Um, and I mean, this is the interesting question about when we start to become skeptical about certain phenomena, how far that takes us. Do we wind up saying not only do faces not exist, but I don't exist, um, you know, and, and we've talked about this in some of our prior episodes, how, you know, our, our physicality is quite different. We, our cells change over time. Our memories are different. Um, you know, we are not the same thing we were when we were born. We will not be the same thing we are when we die. You know, is there a continuity? Are there breaks? Are there overlapping arcs? Um, and you might think about this with a face. So, you know, you can imagine that my face does look pretty different from when I was a newborn. I didn't have a beard. I didn't have the glasses. You know, my eyes, um, you know, would have been, you know, much bigger in proportions, the rest of my face, all these sorts of things. And, and there is something legitimate in saying, did you have the same face? Um, or was that prior face really an ancestor to this face? So I find it fascinating that people often identify, you talked about identify with their face. Um, so, so for example, uh, Facebook um, is named as such, and yet it's not really about faces, it's about people, right? So you share your life, um, and yet the stand-in for a person is their face. And that's very, very interesting to me. Um, and it might be why people are often quite offended when you don't recognize their face because they feel like you're not recognizing them. Yeah, I, I th this is a little bit of an aside. I meant to mention this earlier, but I actually believe that I have a better chance of re remembering a face after looking at a static image uh, many, many, many times. So like, for example, if I try to imagine my wife's face I really can't it's you know I can see the hair surrounding her face but I can't really see her face but I actually did a um, for uh, one of our anniversaries I took a picture of her a photo from our wedding day and I uh, taught myself how to draw and you know do all the shading with pencil drawing and you know and I did a really good you know replication of that image when I think of my wife I think of that image and I actually can see that image in my, in my mind. And to some degree, um, when I do see people, I'll often see their, their uh, Facebook profile photo in my mind. If, I, if I'm able to dredge anything up, that's what I'll see. Um, the problem with that is it's 2D and it's flat and it's stationary. So often when I meet that same person in real life and I see them from just like a five degree angle difference from the photo, I may not, ex I may not actually be able to recognize them. So, so if we have a history of asking our guests uncomfortable questions and, uh, and I'm about to get you in serious trouble with your wife. So feel free to plead the fifth at any point, but <laughs> it will be amusing for our, for our guests. Okay. So the one I'll start mild is if your wife, uh, had a haircut or got a set of different kind of glasses or wore a hat, would you, would you recognize her? Uh, not from a static image, but I would, but she would immediately be given away if she was in real life and moving around because I would recognize her gestures and the way she moves her body. Okay. Uh, are there times where if the light changes um, or if where, where you start to think I, I feel like I know that's my wife, but, but, but I'm deducing it. In other words, this could be someone else who's doing a good imitation of my wife. Early on, for sure. I actually seem to recall when we were dating, being at a club or something and seeing someone that looked very similar to her and not being sure. But again, it snapped into... I think I heard the person speak and it snapped in that, Oh, that's not her. Yeah. So that can definitely happen. So you did have the best excuse when, you know, you were dancing with some other woman going, Hey, I thought it was you. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you're not going to air this, are you? Because uh, I think I want to take this idea. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I mean, I've had this experience on a date uh, where they'll turn their head by five degrees or the light will change uh, or someone will walk past and there'll be a shadow over their face. And it is quite a startling 
uh, it's quite startling because I have not seen their face from that angle properly yet. And so I haven't mapped that angle. Uh, and, and obviously I know that instantaneously that person who's sitting in front of me has not been swapped out for someone else who looks quite similar. It does feel that way. Um, and I think that's something that a lot of non-face blind people don't really understand is the distinction between actually directly recognizing someone and deducing who they are. So working out who they are versus actually seeing it. Um, and, and it requires actually seeing someone for who they are to have the emotional responses that you would normally have towards that person. That, that's what's been something quite interesting that I found in my relation to other people is that the moment I stop directly recognizing them and only having to deduce who they are, I stop feeling the same way about them. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, so in my job, um, I have to meet way more people than anyone should have to meet, face blind or not, right? So that that's just part of the job. Thousands of people that I may interact with. And one thing that I recognize as a huge stressor, stressor in my life is the fact that as I'm building up a profile of that person, you're learning little bits about them as you go. Without a face, it's really hard to think what you might attach that to. Like if you think of the brain as a database, right? There's a slot in the database for this entity named Jason, right? <laughs> Um, and I've just learned that you live in South Africa and uh, you went to Vit, Vit Vader's Fond, Vit Vader's Rond. I, I, get, I keep getting that wrong, right? So no, that's, right. What, that's right. Yeah, I know what, which university you went to. So I learned all these bits and pieces, but what am I actually attaching that to in the human brain if there's not a face? I do think the human brain is built to use a face as the primary locator for information like that. And so... I think it kind of floats uh, a little bit in a more disconnected way in my brain that's harder to draw together until I come up with an alternate profile for you that's not face. And uh, mm. there's a lot of anxiety around that. Speaking of anxiety, the other bit is, um, yeah, I'm very jealous of people who, you know, can see someone and instantly recognize them in a passive way. I think that's the thing that uh, bothers me the most or that I'm most jealous about, you know, normies, if you will, is that it's just, it just happens for you. And, and, you know, for me, if I go into private eye mode, there's sort of two levels of private eye. There's um, almost passive private eye. It's sort of a, a low level program that's running. Uh, and then there's active oh my God, this person knows exactly who I am and I don't know. And then it's very much in the front of my mind in an active pursuit to try to ask them questions and learn who they are. Um, Without them knowing that you're trying right. to, to realize, to, to know who they are, to learn who they are. Yeah. 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 I, fi I find that experience very uncomfortable. So one of the things I'm quite curious about is whether other things track with being face blind. So, I mean, you both talked about the sense of social anxiety of, going out and seeing people and not knowing who they are, but they know who you are. And so I imagine a big social event as Jeff described earlier is anxiety inducing because there are a whole bunch of people who know who you are and you don't know who they are. And it's even harder because, you know, I mean, I imagine that the horror show is people wearing uniforms. Um, so if you're at a school in South Africa, it's very common for us to all have identical school uniforms in America. I know that's, that's common, um, but that must be very tough if, the sort of range of identifiers is gone and that there are masses of people. And so what I wonder is if being face blind then tracks with being introverted or with other kinds of traits. Um, uh, you know, one of the things that, you know, Jason will be better uh, positioned to sort of tell the story um, is he dated someone who wore glasses occasionally and, um, dealt with that person as if they were two people um, mm. and, and had very different kind of emotional relationships with them as if they were separate people. There was, you know, a uh, glasses guy and non glasses guy. And, and Jason made a point of pointing this out and saying, I want to, I really like glasses version of you. Can we, I want to go on a date with that person. Yeah. How did he take me. that? <laughs> he, he was, so it was fascinating because he was quite perplexed when I told him initially, um, and 
then he started to ask more and more questions and it came out that he was face blind too. Oh, wow. um, yeah, maybe not as badly as I was, but definitely some face blindness. And once he understood that, he was quite disturbed by his own face blindness initially, but once he understood that, he, he really went out of his way to always wear the glasses. Um, and so I stopped dating Richard without glasses and only dated Richard with glasses. It got very complicated when we'd go to bed because I said to him, we either do this in the dark or you wear your glasses. It's your choice. <laughs> You're a pretty demanding partner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, in certain ways, I think so. Um, and, and I noticed that I've only ever dated people who look very distinctive. Um, who I could really pick out in a crowd because they are weird in some way. This anxiety thing is um, at the core of why I started the podcast. Um, because like most people with prosopagnosia, I hate saying that word. It's, it's almost as long as a philosophical word. That is typically unknown to most people who have it, right? Again, if you were colorblind, I, I'm actually colorblind and I had no idea really that I was colorblind until uh, as a teenager, I went to get my pilot's license and I had to uh, get a physical and I went to the doctor and he pulled out at that, at the last thing in the, in the physical is he pulled out um, one of those colorblind book tests with all the circles, so the colored circles, and you're supposed to see numbers in the circles. And I saw very few of them. Right. But I'd lived my whole life with it not really being a known thing. I mean, I guess I saw brown and green as about the same color, but it was very distinctive to others, but that's not something that would impact your life in a way that anyone would notice. And often we go through life until a pretty late age, until you read an article or hear a podcast or see a TV uh, news sh newscast about it, that you realize, wow, that sounds a lot like me. And then the pieces click into place. That's another recurring thing I've heard on my my podcast. And so you know, this idea behind the podcast is I want people to hear people from all walks of life who uh, have dealt with this, realize that there's nothing to be ashamed of and uh, sort of take um, my last guest's philosophy that, eh, okay, I'm bad at recognizing faces. Let's move on. It, you know, just having that answer as to why you struggle with this all the time brings a fair amount of relief. And I can, I can really recommend to uh, people who are, who are listening to this, um, to this episode uh, that you go to Jeff's Face Blindness podcast and listen to that. Uh, and, and the reason I say that is because it's very likely that even if you're not face blind, that you know someone who is. Um, it's 2% it's of people. That's one in 50. It's a lot of people. Um, it's also something that tends to run in families. Um, so uh, if, if, there is some, if you are face blind, it's very likely that one of your children would be, or one of your parents would be, or siblings. Um, and you, yeah, you, you may not even know that you're face blind. Uh, Mark is going to include some of the, the video tests uh, that he was talking about in this video. So uh, that would give you some idea as well. So Jeff, I'm really glad you brought up uh, colorblindness as an analogy. Um, there's a, a sort of famous series of videos of people on YouTube who put on these glasses that allow them to see color properly for the first time. Um, and they have these freak out moments where they're, they're kind of in um, colorful places like carnivals or, um, you know, botanical gardens. And they're like, Oh my goodness, that's what purple is. That's incredible. Um, what's interesting is that friends of mine who are colorblind uh, almost have had no desire to try the glasses on. Uh, and the guy who came up with the glasses found this as well. A lot of people said, oh, well, you know, this is the way I am. And I, I know them interest. And it was these sort of revelation videos of people freaking out that sort of helped sell them. Um, what's interesting from what I gather with face blindness is that there's a drug you can take as well that temporarily uh, grants you the ability to see a face as a face, that the parts come together as a whole. And, and I wonder um, what your view would be on both of those things. Would you wear the glasses and take the drug? Um. I wouldn't wear the glasses only because I don't perceive colorblindness as impacting my life in any way. And uh, I'd rather not have to drag more crap around in the world with me that I need to function. That's it. That's just pure laziness. Uh, if that drug, uh, could, if mainlining that drug, like having an IV connected to you, 
uh, meant that it would, you know, be with you continuously. I would every day before I walk out the door, strap it on <laughs> full time. Yep. Now I've had some guests on the show. I've asked a similar question, you know, cause like, I don't see this as a disability, but let's just say often when you see people uh, being interviewed about a disability, they'll say, Oh, well, uh, I'm so glad that I lost my legs in Iraq because it's made me the person who I am today. I mean, maybe that's true for them, but I would, uh, I would shit can, uh, pardon my French. Am I allowed to cuss on here? Go um, for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would shit can this, uh, uh, face blindness and a heartbeat. I don't see any um, redeeming value to it. <laughs> so the, the drug is oxytocin. Um, oh, and that's a good drug. Yeah, yeah. So it makes you feel good. Uh, yeah. and, and, and it's very interesting. What they found is that people who are face blind do not produce the same sort of oxytocin connections, um, the connections that oxytocin allows in the brain. Um, and that's why they're finding that oxytocin works, but it only works for a little bit of time. So the way they deliver it is with a, with a nasal spray um, and, and it works for about half an hour to an hour. Um, and during that time, they, are, they perform much better on facial recognition tests. Um, and I've never tried it. Uh, they, it does have side effects. They give it to women just before to, to induce labor. Uh, That's where I've heard of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's also the love hormone. So it's what you experience. And this is what I was getting at earlier when I said, when I don't actually recognize someone, I can't feel the same way about them. And I think right. it's because the oxytocin is not being produced. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah. yeah. So, so the oxytocin is the, the bonding hormone. Uh, and it's also what you feel when you look at your pet or your pet looks at you. Um, they also experience oxytocin increases when they see their owners. Um, so when you don't recognize someone and that oxytocin hit doesn't happen, um, then you don't experience that warmth towards the person. So this, the, what this spray does is it gives you that hit and it also is more likely to create the right neural connections in your brain. Um, there was a very, there was an excellent episode on Radiolab once um, about um, autistics who uh, were given a temporary treatment and in an fMRI machine um, which allowed them to suddenly perceive things that other autistics struggle with. So one of them is, for example, irony. Um, so autistics struggle with irony. So they go into the machine. It, 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 uh, it, there's a focused electromagnetic pulse that goes into their brain. And for a brief period of time, um, they can now do things that, that autistic people generally can't do. But then after a few hours, it's gone. And the big question that on Radiolab they asked is really the question I think Mark was getting at is if you have that choice to experience life without the symptom for a few hours and then it comes back, is that better than not having that experience at all? Is, this, is there some enormous loss that you would feel? Better to have lost love than never loved at all? Yeah, uh, that's a tough one. Um, I think I, I think I could, uh, I think I could live with that. I'd, I'd take the 15 second one, one time shot just to experience it. Yeah. And then I'd go back to living life with all the tools that I've developed still intact and I'd be okay with it. Yeah. Mark has a birthday party soon and I can usually recognize about half the people at the birthday party, but we have <laughs> two friends that both have shaved heads and I can never tell them apart. I've known them for years and years and years and I always misremember them. Um, and it would be really, really pleasant on the first time to have a greater than 50% accuracy <laughs> at, uh, at saying hi. I mean, they're both really nice guys, but actually in my mind, they've almost formed one person. Um, yeah it's very hard to actually remember who, you know, attributes of, of each separately. Yeah. That's interesting. There's an, I know we're probably running long here. Um, but, uh, I, I think there is something to that database slot for an individual where you're starting to form the memory of that entity in your mind. Um, I've experienced that recently. My, my son is in, uh, Boy Scouts. And so I, I go, you know, with the other dads to some of the Boy Scout camping trips. And there's a, one of the fathers in the trip. Um, I imagined that he was the same father from a previous Boy Scout trip, uh, troop that we belong to. And, and we switched to a new troop, the one we're in now. I thought it was the same guy for a long time. And I actually 
didn't remember his name, which was good because I just interacted, you know, in the Hey You sort of way with him. Um, and at some point I realized, oh, wait a minute, this is not the same guy. But now when I try to imagine both of them, they have gotten mixed in just the way that you're describing. Absolutely. I, I'll have to work to disentangle them into two separate database units. <laughs> So I've stopped trying. Uh, when I confuse people, I've stopped trying to to, dis to disambiguate them. Um, and I just treat them the same way, uh, very warmly to both. Um, and I just, I, I, just I, I can't keep track of, of what happened to which. Uh, but I, I, I used to think that was quite disrespectful, but now I realize that it's kind of just the way I have to interact with them. And this gets to like a broader point, which is that it, this is kind of the, the bigger philosophical question that all of this raises is how much of the world is real outside of us and how much is our brain processing? Um, and, you know, prosopagnosics just process the world differently. We live in a very different world, but it might not be less real than, than the world uh, neurotypical people live in. It's almost like um, if you could somehow remove a brain from its skull cavity and put it in a jar and keep it, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, thank you so much for joining us today. It was fantastic having you on the show. And again, for anyone who, who's listening, go and listen to Jeff's podcast. Uh, the second episode is the one I first listened to and was so blown away by because uh, it's with the husband of the late Oliver Sacks. Um, who was probably the greatest new neurologist of uh, the 20th century. And Oliver Sacks himself was, was face blind. And there's amazing stories uh, about Oliver navigating his world. And for Jeff to get uh, his husband on the show, uh, in one of his first episodes was an incredible coup. And uh, it's a superb episode. And uh, to anyone listening, I recommend that you, you go, and, go and give the episode a listen. Great talking with you guys. Thanks so much.